Welcome to the ninth uh, presentation of the Claire M. Hubbard Sustainability Series. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we wanna give a special thank you to the trustees of the Claire M. Hubbard Foundation. It's due to their generosity that we are able to put on these presentations with experts at no cost to the general public. Um, and I also want to give a thank you to our MCC IT staff for all of their hard work in putting this presentation together um, and to our presenters for being here today to share their expertise. And we'll hear a presentation about climate change by Doug Cluck from NOAA. Um, and then when we will have a recorded presentation on um, climate change and also some new clouds that are forming in the Arctic due to um, the increase in methane in the atmosphere. And then we will wrap it up with Andrea Beige from uh, the UNL Extension Office. And at the end, we will do a Q&A. So just kind of a note on our format for today. Um, as usual, our speakers will not be taking questions. But if you do have questions during our presentation, please enter them in the Q&A, and we will get to those at the end. Today, we're here, we're talking about climate change and the importance of soil health and agriculture in climate change. And so I just wanna take a quick note and, and mention how important this conversation is for today. Um, you know, we're in a time where organizations, communities and governments are starting to prepare themselves for the changes due to climate change. Um, and there's more and more awareness and intentions around educating around climate change as well. Uh, according to a recent Yale study, 78% of Americans believe that schools should teach about the causes, consequences and potential solutions to global warming and 61% of adults think global warming will harm people in the US. Um, there was also a recent study from the United Nations that showed that extreme weather related disasters are increasing sharply in the past decade. Um, these impact our economies, our people, and our um, ecology as well. So today we'll get a little slice of the pie that is the vast topic of climate change. We could probably do a whole week of presentations, um, but I hope you are able to take away some key lessons about climate change and how it impacts our region and our agriculture as well. Um, so without going any farther, let me go ahead and introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker is Doug Cluck. He's the Climate Services Director in the Central Region for NOAA. He has worked for the National Weather Service and served as a research meteorologist, forecast meteorologist, hydrologist and regional hydrologist. He is the Climate Services Program Manager for the Central Region, and in this capacity, he has focused on building key networks and relationships with core partners and groups with climate change interest in the Central Region. Currently, he serves as the Regional Climate Services Director. His region covers 16 states from the Great Lakes to the Rockies. He works closely with the regional climate centers, state climatologists, tribal colleges and universities, land-grant universities, and extension services state and federal governments and non-governmental organizations on a number of issues, including informing adaptation, climate data stewardship, building climate change capacity, and the assessment of climate services by sector and community. Uh, during extreme climate events, such as drought and major flooding, flooding he coordinates regional information response, uh, attribution, attribution and assessment with several partners, such as the Re regional climate centers and the American Association of State Climatologists. He holds a bachelor in science in geology and an MA in geography from the University of Nebraska. Although he is a native Nebraskan, he currently resides in Kansas City. So Doug, thank you for being here today. And it looks like you are ready to, to go, to take it, to kick it off for us. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm uh, uh, happy that you guys actually invited me to, to do this. I always like, if you will, coming back to Nebraska <laughs> to give presentations virtually or in person. So someday I'll be back in person. We'll see how it goes then. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, and let me just move these little heads off my screen over here a little bit. What I'm going to talk mostly about today it uh, comes from a couple reports that came out in 2017 and 2018. In short, these are, these are federally produced and federally mandated reports, sort of keeping track of what's going on in our climate across the United States. Um, one is very science specific. The other one is includes science, but is more regional 
And as you can see, the second report that I had up there, and I, um, let me go back. All you really need to do in terms of finding these, because they're all online, they're very accessible. In fact, there's a presentation for every chapter. Uh, you can download those. You can read. You can read the. Uh, the, uh, the they're not overly technical uh, and such. Um, uh, just type in National Climate Assessment in your Google browser, and you they will pop up one way or the other. If you can't find them, you can always let me know. These are all the chapters that are in that uh, that second uh, uh, booklet. Uh, there on the lower right are the regions that it's broken down into. As you can see, the Nebraska and Iowa are separated there between the Northern Great Plains and the Midwest. Um, but nonetheless, uh, all these other issues, sectors, uh, and, and regions are covered. So, um, so now on to the sort of the meat, the crux of the of the issue here. I'm going to start sort of internationally talking about temperatures and precipitation generally, and then sort of slowly but surely focusing a little bit more down on our particular region. Um, uh, to be honest with you, it's going to be scratching at the surface. And I'm sorry about the overviewness of this uh, presentation. But to be honest, every single element that I'm talking about could be a talk in and of itself that would be relatively interesting. Let's start with the annual uh, global land and ocean temperature graphic on the upper left. Uh, you can see it dates back to 1880 on the x-axis, the bottom axis there, to more or less present. I think this stopped in about 2016. Um, it's, uh, uh, that'll be updated soon. But anyway, as you can see, the temperatures across the, the, uh, the entire Earth have risen, um, especially in the latter half of the uh, 20th century and, and early 21st century. On the right is a map depiction on where what areas have warmed uh, the most or the most quickly uh, over that period, more or less, when you compare the last uh, 30 years uh, to the earliest or to the first uh, 60 years of uh, last century. Um, here is a record of the top 10 years in the world, warmest years on record. And you can see 2016 being the warmest year on record. And it, you can go down the line and you'll notice it's somewhat of a pattern there. The pattern is that a lot of these years are pretty recent. And you can look back. Uh, and the only, I, I guess 1998 to some of us is recent. Um, some of us older people seems recent. <laughs> but uh, you can look back at the last 10 years and you can see most of those are fairly uh, fairly recent. And this year, I think we'll get into this in just a minute. Um, this is, to, oh, let me look, let me just go back to 2019. Remember 2019, we had a big flood uh, across the Midwest or floods uh, across the Midwest and Great Plains. And note, note where, um, this is a map of the world, obviously, and where you see pink and orange or red colors, all those areas are above normal in terms of temperature. Um, note that there are very few cooler than average areas, but one of them is pretty much our backyard. So if you thought last year was cool, um, it was from an annual point of view, but recognize that was dwarfed by the amount of uh, warmth across the, uh, the world. So, and then if we look uh, so far this year, uh, January through September of this year, uh, 2020, we see a similar pattern in that there's a lot more red and pink than there is uh, blue, blue being below normal. And normally what we would, I, I guess, like to see if we weren't having a climate change sort of scenario going on, uh, we would see about half and half, or at least a third and a third and a third of normal up there. But that's not what we see. And if you look back the last 10, 15, 20 years, and it's, 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 almost always this color, if you will. In other words, warmer than, uh, than, than, than average. And 2019 was the second warmest year on, um, on record. 2016, remember, was, was number one on that uh, list that I just showed you a couple slides ago. So far this year in 2020, uh, it's the second, second warmest January through September. And it's a good chance by the end of the year, once we get to the December 31st, we calculate all the numbers again, uh, it, will be one of the, it will be the warmest year, 2020. On we go. 
Um, we also sort of do this. We, we kind of keep track of what big issues happen each year. And I'm not going to go, <laughs> believe me, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, it's too much to, to talk about. But we keep track in, this is an example of 20, what happened in 2019 and some of the bigger impacts in 2019. But notice all the little temperature gauges around the world. Those are all indicating um, not necessarily the warmest, but somewhere near the warmest uh, period uh, or, or year that they've had in a lot of those a lot of those locations. Yeah, some of the other uh, icons on there uh, talk about in tropical storms or or, or sea ice extent uh, or or heavy rainfall events. In fact, that little green dot in uh, in um, North America, or actually in U.S. It does talk specifically about the Missouri and Mississippi uh, Platte, Platte River is even mentioned in there, and the Arkansas rivers uh, from March to July and some of the insane uh, flooding that we had in 2019. Okay, um, someone uh, spoke a little bit earlier uh, about uh, extreme weather and that kind of thing. I just wanted to point out that we've been keeping track of billion plus dollar events now, these can be tornado, which aren't necessarily climate change derived, but there's also other types of um, um, billion dollar climate and weather events that happen every year. This is the 2020 map so far. Of course, I don't want any more of those to appear, any more icons to appear on this, on this chart. Uh, unfortunately, it's likely that uh, one or two will, but we've already had a record number of events or, or tied the record number of events uh, for 2020, and, and these are all billion plus uh, uh, dollar events. So when you look at these, and, and each one of those icons is a different uh, system or a different weather event or, or, or whatever, and you, you can see there's hurricanes and tornadoes and severe and flooding and uh, drought and wildfires, uh, and there's a few others. But when you look at the record of extreme events in the United States based on billion dollar disasters since 1980, and these are inflation adjusted numbers, uh, you see a rise from left to right uh, and a pretty, pretty steep one actually in, in the number of these. Yes, some of it is people are living in the wrong places more and more and um, hopefully uh, that, that will remedy itself over time. But, um, part of it also is the fact that we're just seeing more extreme uh, weather event, weather and climate events um, on average. All right, back to the climate, back, well, it's all climate change, but back to the, uh, the national view of things in terms of temperature. So the upper map on, the upper map presented here shows from an annual point of view where we see the most warming occur. So the dark red colors show you where the, the, the fastest uh, annual temperature rise is in the country. Um, you see actually some places, uh, we call this the warming hole down here in the south uh, southeast part of the US where temperatures actually aren't rising so much. Um, uh, then we break it down into winter and summer temperatures, and you can see our winter temperatures definitely have a, a pattern, especially in, in Nebraska and Iowa, in, that, in, in terms of being warmer than they have in the past. Uh, most of those winter temperature averages are being uh, buoyed by or, or raised up by, uh, by our low temperatures not being as cold as they used to be. In the summertime, you see that, gosh, uh, what? What's going on here? We're actually cooler than, uh, we're, we're getting cooler as time goes on. Well, number one, that's temporary. And two, one of the reasons for that is the amount of humidity in the air. We've seen an increase in, in the amount of humidity in the air. And that shouldn't be a surprise as, um, as irrigation and more, more places are irrigated, but also because uh, warmer air can hold a lot more moisture. So couple things and, and thus keeping temperatures down, believe it or not. So keeping temperatures down, but not necessarily the heat index, which we all love and hate in the, in the winter, uh, summertime. Um, I'll go through this really quickly, but this is also from the National Climate Assessment. This is just showing the number of daily record highs and lows and which one, uh, when, when we have more of one than the other, it sort of shows up on this, this chart. Note the red, indicates where we've seen a lot more record highs. And that has been more recent. We've seen a lot more record highs in our daily records 
in, in terms of temperatures than we have seen record lows. Um, and this is really this is really indicative of, uh, if you will, record minimum temperatures. So if our record if our record minimum temperature for today was uh, let's say it was 56 degrees in Omaha, and it only got down to 60, we would have set a new record minimum. That's sort of what this this chart is is, is trying to indicate. And again, you see the same trend as you go from earlier in the century to now, a lot more uh, above normal uh, uh, temperature records. <clears throat> okay, so looking at uh, global, uh, looking at, looking globally at different scenarios. Now, I'm not saying these are predictions. I'm saying these are scenarios. Uh, we see that dark line sort of moving from the left to right down there, and it ends around well, we'll just say 2020. Um, and then some lines going away from that into the future, into the 2100 time frame. Each one of those is a different model or group of models that has been thrown together uh, to, with different levels of greenhouse gases um, uh, realized within each one of them. So, uh, for example, what we call the higher scenario is if we continue at our current rate of putting CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and, in fact, continue to increase as we've done more or less uh, over the last 10, 20 years in terms of increasing our greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, the next scenario, the lower scenario, is if we start getting a handle on some, <coughs> excuse me, some of those greenhouse gases and not putting as much in, and then green as if um, pretty much we shut off uh, the greenhouse gases that we we humans put into the atmosphere. You see a leveling out there. One of the things that, we, that we, we need to think about is that a certain amount of greenhouse gases are baked into whatever happens into the future. So we're going to see warming, uh, even if we shut it completely off right today, we'd see warming uh, continue for the next uh, 50 to uh, 50 to uh, 100 years, because a lot of that warming is, if I, as I said, baked into the baked into the atmosphere and oceans, uh, for that matter, already. So um, the reason I'm showing you these different model outputs, if you will, for the future is that we're going to refer to them, in, uh, especially the top two, 8.5 and 4.5, uh, throughout. One other thing I want to talk about very quickly is it doesn't take a lot of shifting in terms of average temperatures either to the left or to the right to make a big difference in terms of what we see in terms of extreme events. So notice, um, notice if, and this is what's happened or is happening, is that we're moving, we're shifting temperatures on average to the right, in this case, towards warmer, all right? And notice what happens to the, if you will, bell curve, if, when we do that to cold. Doesn't mean cold goes away. It just means the likelihood of extremely cold, extreme cold weather, record cold weather is much less. So, hey, in your lifetime, if you're experiencing cold weather, you, you're experiencing a rare event. Now, um, so, so I'm not saying it, it may be painful, but <laughs> it may be painful in the winter to experience those extremely cold weather uh, scenarios, but they're pretty rare. So, you know, enjoy that you've lived through something that's rare. Um, on the other hand, more extremely hot weather is more likely as well as we've, again, shifted that curve to the right, making the probability of those things more likely. Doesn't mean they're gonna happen every year, but it certainly makes it more likely to happen. <clears throat> we'll talk about that in perspective or in the context of temperature and precipitation. So here's what the, the models are saying in terms of how much warmth in Fahrenheit uh, we'll probably see or likely to see uh, based on these two scenarios, on the left is the lower scenario at the mid-century, about tw uh, um, 2050, and the uh, lower scenario at 20 or 2100, basically. Generally, warmer temperatures, two to four degrees as we get towards the uh, end of the century, and then the higher scenario in which we don't shut off much greenhouse gas, three, uh, three degrees by mid-century, and um, a devastating seven to eight, believe me. Uh, uh, by the end of the century, if, if we don't do anything about that. <clears throat> what does that mean in terms of, uh, let's say, 90 degree temperatures in our neighborhood 
or and the lack of warmth or, or yeah, uh, too much warmth in the, in the wintertime below 32. So the top map shows us the number of days that we, we would realize in the mid-century if we continued on with uh, increasing greenhouse gases, uh, something like 20 to 40 or about 30 days more of 90 plus degree temperatures each year. Uh, and then conversely, the number of uh, fewer days of 32 and below, which sounds great to everybody, but it's not necessarily good for our ecosystems and a lot of other things, uh, below 32, about 20 to 30 days uh, less, if you will, in our neck of the woods. <clears throat> um, one other point I want to get to here is, I, I mentioned this earlier, as you warm the atmosphere, warm the temperature, uh, the air can hold a lot more water for every degree you go up. I'm not going to get into all the particulars here because it's a little bit technical, uh, but it's that curve there as you warm, um, the amount of moisture that you can hold in the air goes up very, very rapidly. And that's something to also to keep in mind as we go forward. And why we see maps like this. So <clears throat> what have we seen so far? Uh, in terms of realization of, of precipitation uh, across the United States. How do things compare now as, uh, to, to what they did earlier at last century? Well, this is what we see. We see a much wetter upper Midwest, Great Plains, Northeast, all the way down to the Southern Plains for that matter. Wherever it's green there, we've seen an increase in precipitation, annual precipitation. And uh, each one of those is a percent more or a percent uh, uh, above or below. In the Southwest, kind of a different story, um, but that's a different, that is a different story. Uh, we also see trends in, uh, don't lower left, trends in our flood magnitude change. Uh, <laughs> I don't need to tell anybody in Omaha about the Missouri River and uh, the magnitude of floods that we've been seeing 2011 and 2019, 2018 for that matter, and a few other years we can probably throw in there. Um, we've seen a lot more flooding, especially on the bigger rivers. Um, and the other map that doesn't have any description on it is shows the increase in percentage of uh, extreme precipitation events. We've seen, a, a, especially in the Northeast US, in the Midwest, we've seen 42 and 55% increases in the number of very heavy rainfall events. The, the old adage, when it rains, it pours, is very, very, uh, very fitting for uh, what, we're, what we've seen. And that's from 1958 to 2016. We're just seeing bigger, 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 heavy, more, more heavier rainfall events when it rains. Um, these are our trends again. This goes back to that map I just showed. But if you look, they're broken down by decades. You can look at the Great Plains North and the uh, Midwest on the top. And you can see there's a definite uh, increase in <clears throat> rain, rainfall period uh, across those two areas when lumped together. And this, this is the map of increased, or, or yeah, observed change, observed, not, these are not modeled. This is what has been observed in the great, in the Northern Plains, as well as the Midwest, in terms of very heavy precipitation. We're not imagining this. We're not modeling this. This is from the data. All right. So uh, what does all that mean when it turns, you know, people always say, Another thing people say often is one in a hundred year events seem to be happening every year. Well, um, there's always a 1% chance of having a hundred year event, by the way, that doesn't have to happen once every hundred years. But what we have seen in terms of, in this case, a 20 year return frequency is that they're happening, or I'm sorry, is that the, the there is an increase in precipitation and that increase, at least in our neck of the woods, is the biggest in the fall season. So when we have a one in 20 year event, we're seeing more precipitation in the fall, which is sort of interesting. Yeah, there are some, there are some uh, increases in other seasons, but fall seems to be uh, uh, where it's being realized the most. And here are the projections. Uh, again, not forecasts, but scenarios based on, based on models of what will happen with, again, sort of the worst, or worst case a worst case uh, greenhouse gas, um, uh, it, put, putting that into the atmosphere and such. So winter time, uh, we're likely to see more precipitation. Springtime, somewhat more. 
Summertime, it's really uh, hard to say. There's some indications of dryness, but it's not a very strong connection. And in the fall, really very little, uh, very little for the models anyway. Uh, they're not saying a lot in terms of what we're going to see in terms of precipitation changes in the fall. One thing I'll say about the summer is <clears throat> even if we keep our precipitation exactly the same as it's always been for the last hundred years, at the same average, if we have warmer temperatures, it's going to be less usable water uh, because of evaporation processes and such because of warmer, uh, although, although the same amount of water is falling out of the sky, uh, it may be coming down harder, that's another issue, but it also will be evaporated more because we have warmer temperatures. Uh, this is just very quickly showing you uh, between the lower and higher scenarios of greenhouse gases that we will realize also more and more heavy rainfall events being the top 1% of rainfall events. Hope that makes sense to you all. Uh, by the end of the uh, 20th century, uh, 21st century. Um, I'm going to briefly go over this really quick, but last year was such a phenomenal year in terms of uh, precipitation. We set all sorts of records uh, across the, the nation and really in our neck of the woods too, uh, in terms of the wettest eight, 10, nine, you know, there's a whole up to five years, months on record. It's the wettest we've ever seen uh, in a 125 year record. Uh, for the year of 2019, wherever you see that darkest green color, that all those states to our north, uh, those are the wettest <clears throat> those states have ever been and since 1895, uh, when taken as a whole year like that. And look at Nebraska, 123 out of 125. So only two years were wetter, uh, pretty similar across the upper Midwest, Midwest in general, very, very wet. Um, and then one more sort of pointing at 2019 is uh, if you take all, this is this excludes Nebraska, but I just wanted to point this one out. If you take all the Midwest states from Minnesota, basically to Ohio, there's nine of them in there. And you look at their average precipitation for that huge area, right? Those nine states, uh, 2019 set the record. Okay, no huge surprise. But the, the point is it broke the record by three inches. That's hard to do over nine state region. Very, very hard to do. We went from 43 is the record, 43.06 to 46.09. Um, that worries a lot of folks when they see those types of things. All right, on we go. Uh, just showing you quickly what the Corps of Engineer, Engineers merit, uh, measures on the, uh, on the Missouri River. We've had a lot of records or near record uh, of, of flows on the Missouri River uh, lately. Uh, we've uh, uh, 2019 is there in the red. It almost broke the 2011 record, but didn't quite. Uh, it missed it by just a bit. Um, but note that it's been wetter, uh, you know, since, oh, I'd say the, the mid 90s till now, we've seen a definite increase in the peak of flows. Um, this is something I always try to uh, tell people is that the future is not, um, future is not what it used to be. And there are several references to that here uh, in terms of this cat and expecting um, it's just another bird. I'm going to I'm going to kill it like or I'm going to eat it or whatever. Play with it like I've always done. Well, that's something we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to think about as we uh, as we try to approach or, or try to be sustainable and resilient in, in terms of climate change. And I'm shifting my gears just a little bit. That's why I have these little cartoons in here a little. Uh, joke here also from a keep your social distance point of view when it comes to wildlife. This is sent to me by somebody out in the West. Um, I'll let you look at that real quick. What to do and what not to do in terms of social distancing. All right, on we go. So um, one thing we're also seeing and, 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 and thanks to Climate Central for these wonderful graphics. I, I, I've stolen them and used them because they, they're, they're nice graphics. But what we're uh, seeing is our summer season expanding a little bit, warmer temperatures. For example, Des Moines and Omaha. Des Moines and Omaha, you see, uh, we have f five days later, the last 85 degree day is. That's indicative of our expansion of summer. Um, um, US Temperature trends since 1970, I pulled out winter because that's our strongest one, I think, in our, our neck of the woods. Uh, we're showing uh, our winters getting warmer. And again, a lot of people think that's a great thing, but 
it's not necessarily a great thing for uh, for the ecosystem out there. And I'm not an ecosystem expert, but there's a number of people and a number of folks who can tell you that certain insects um, love the fact what we're not getting as cold as we used to, uh, as well as um, as well as some animals as well. Uh, fall warming, we've definitely seen fall warming as well uh, across the area. Let me go on. Um, just now I threw these in here because I can't cover health completely. And by the way, Sally, just cut me off because I'm probably going, I hope I'm not going, I can't even, where's my clock? If I'm going too long, just, you know, give me the, uh, give me the ax because I have a couple more slides here or just butt in and tell me to be quiet. Um, Health, health impacts um, human both in ecosystem. Here's just a list of potential issues that we're already facing. Those of you with allergies, you know that we have a longer growing season. Yes, for ragweed and lots of other things generally. Uh, longer pest season. Again, I mentioned that a little earlier for all kinds of um, things we don't like. Uh, invasive species, some of them really like our, our longer seasons. They grow better. Um, heat stress issues for outdoor workers, especially in agriculture and construction, rural and urban, by the way. Uh, heat stress, obviously, for animals and livestock are another issue that we're facing. And increased, uh, of course, increased inc occurrence of extremes are not good for human health if you're flooded, right? And uh, certain communities are differentially impacted, uh, obviously, by uh, big events, uh, uh, by, by uh, increasing heat. Uh, just quickly about infrastructure, we've built our infrastructure based upon what uh, on normals based on the last century. Uh, those normals are probably not the same as they were. Uh, there's a lot of people working on this issue in terms of, okay, well, do we, do we start building uh, 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 viaducts or conduits or infrastructure based on what we're having today? Or do we actually think about what may be happening 50 years from now or 20 years from now um, in terms of temperature and precipitation. What do we build to? We get this question all the time. Do I have an answer for that? Not exactly, but we can sort of uh, hint. Uh, the other thing to think about in terms of climate change is extreme events have profound and long lasting um, effects. Uh, uh, Katrina was a great example of a hurricane displacing thousands of people. Abandonment of certain cr uh, practices, crops, lands uh, based on too much heat or whatever. Um, in 21, 20, in 20, 2011, 2012, uh, livestock was moved all around when, when feed stocks were, were lost, especially in the Southern Plains and then the next year in the Northern Plains. So um, other things to think about in terms of agriculture, I know this isn't my subject, but uh, um, Andrea is gonna cover this completely in a different way. Uh, I just wanna point out, this is also from the National Climate Assessment, increases in warm season humidity and, and precipitation uh, uh, will lead to or have led to eroded soils and created great conditions for pests and pathogens, degraded the quality of stored grains, uh, uh, also projected changes in precipitation coupled with rising temperatures by mid-century will reduce uh, uh, Midwest agricultural productivity, productivity um, to the 80s without uh, major technological advances, impacts of wetter growing season, uh, reduced workable field days, planning delays, et cetera, et cetera. These are all really pertinent for our area. Uh, the other thing I want to point out, and you may have noticed this one, um, when we do have a mild winter, like we did in 2012, and I think we did uh, partially of this. Uh, anyway, these come and go every year. But recently, we've seen more mild winters. And when that happens, we can still get those pushes of uh, um, average freeze or you know late freeze, early freezes, all that kind of stuff happening, which can really do a lot of damage to uh, horticultural as well as crops that get planted um, and such. And I'll stop now because I probably said more than enough. So thank you very, very much. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, next, we're gonna go into our recorded presentation. Anthony was not available to be with us today, but we still wanted to share his expertise and his knowledge on climate change and also on the new research project that he is working on with NASA. Anthony Galdemez is a sixth and eighth grade teacher at the Omaha Public School District. He has created a space curriculum program at his school that teaches and improves STEM and space science skills. He is very passionate about space science and his students know him as the astronaut teacher. 
Galdemez applied to be an astronaut in 2015, and he is currently an astronaut applicant for the moon mission of 2021. He is currently working on certifications to become a scientific astronaut. Galdemez is also a military veteran and finished his master's in education with a concentration in STEM. He is also a certified NASA Endeavor instructor from Columbia University, and he teaches at the Aim for the Stars Science and Math Camp at the University of Nebraska Omaha during the summer. His goal as a solar system ambassador is to bring his passion for space exploration to Omaha and the nation. So just a quick reminder, he will not be here for the Q&A, um, but if you have questions about Doug's presentation or, or Andrea's, feel free to put those in the Q&A and we will get to those at the end. Hi, I'm Anthony Galdemez, Science on a Sphere instructor and a scientific astronaut in training. Normally, we don't think about climate change until we think back how much we didn't plow our driveways here in Nebraska over a winter storm, or if we get caught outside in a thunderstorm and we can't find our keys. But it is very important for us to know about climate change because there's a lot to deal with it. Now, a couple of things that I wanna show you on the science on the sphere is the scientific data that we collected to be able to put on there and display it and communicate it because sometimes communicating this data is more important than collecting the data itself. Now, this first video on the sphere that we're gonna watch is about carbon dioxide and a big, big part it plays in our atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, or CO2, acts like insulation in the atmosphere, trapping heat leaving the Earth's surface. Because of that, CO2 is called a greenhouse gas, and along with the other greenhouse gases, it keeps our planet from getting too cold, contributing to making the Earth habitable. Since 1958, atmospheric carbon dioxide has been measured at an observatory on the Mauna Loa Mountain in Hawaii. The white line shows atmospheric CO2 levels rising and falling at the Mauna Loa Observatory. A fall and rise occurs each year, and the explanation for that lies in the Earth's plants. This image shows plant life measured by satellites. Plants on land are shown in green, while plant life in the ocean is colored green, red, and yellow. Plants take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, use it in photosynthesis, and release it when they die or go dormant. The Mauna Loa CO2 curve goes down in the Northern Hemisphere spring and summer when a vast abundance of plant life is using carbon dioxide in photosynthesis, and the curve goes up in winter when many plants are dormant and no longer photosynthesizing, but animals are still exhaling CO2. While this natural cycle has systematic decreases and increases in CO2 every year, there is also a long-term upward trend drawn as a red line. This gradual change toward more CO2 in the atmosphere in recent decades is in large part caused by humans. We are putting CO2 into the air faster than natural processes can remove it. We do this in many ways, including through our use of coal, oil, and natural gas, and through cement production. Cutting down forests also contributes to more carbon dioxide in the air. Here are measurements of global CO2 with the lowest amounts shaded gray, higher amounts yellow, and highest amounts red. More CO2 is added to the atmosphere in the northern hemisphere where most of us live. Why does it matter that CO2 is increasing? Even though greenhouse gases contribute to making our Earth habitable, too much in the way of greenhouse gases could lead to a level of warming that could have an array of troublesome consequences, including sea level rise and extinctions of species unable to adapt to the changes. Each of us has a carbon footprint. It's the amount of carbon we put into the air through the choices we make about energy consumption, food, and transportation. Each of us could make choices that would help to reduce our individual carbon footprints. So as we heard in the video, um, carbon dioxide is a big issue here on planet Earth. Um, later this year, we will be talking about the Arctic, the first expeditions there, and we will also be talking about Antarctica and its scientific data that we have been collecting and scientific data that we collected in the past. Different things that are going on and different uh, sides of the poles there. One other thing that I wanna say as a scientific astronaut in training, um, I am privileged to be able to be part of those programs that will be going out to Antarctica and collecting data with new high altitude air balloons and collecting data as well from satellites that are orbiting around 
the South Pole and the North Pole. We have been able to collect data from the North Pole and the South Pole. We have clouds out there that are really, really bright blue. And the reason for that is that once the sun sets, the sunlight still reflects off those clouds because they're so high in the mesosphere. These clouds are noctilucent clouds. The reason for that is that we take our carbon dioxide, which we just saw in the video, and we combine methane gases. And when those two chemicals combine, they go really high in the sky where we can see these clouds. And this is where we're collecting our data from. Normally they're not there, but these phenomenons that we're able to record give us a little bit more scientific data behind them. These clouds are rare, and sometimes they're seen as far as New Mexico over the summer months. Now, here in Nebraska, they're rarely seen, but they are visible sometimes in the summer. The reason why these phenomenons are important to record is because they do um, have effects on our atmosphere and our land and other parts of our environment. Let's watch how some of these weather phenomenons have affected our Arctic Circle. So over the course of years, you can see here on the North Pole how we get less and less ice coming back after every summer. We can also gather scientific data based off of uh, the scientific tests that we do over the North Pole to see how old the ice has been, or if we're getting new ice that's being exposed to the atmosphere that's never been exposed before. As you can see in 2012, we have way more uh, newer ice or new ice that's being exposed out to the atmosphere than we had before. So gathering this scientific data is very important for us to know what's going on around the planet. Now that you know a little bit more about our carbon dioxide and our methane and what that creates, we wanna get into something that we've talked about for years, something called the ozone layer. For years, we've heard that there's been a giant hole in the ozone layer, but what we're really looking at now is that there is a recovery stage to it, but why is that? So the ozone layer protects us from ultraviolet rays that are, can be considered pretty harmful from the sun. Um, without that ozone layer protection, it's very, very difficult to stay protected when we're outside just doing regular chores or just even being out. One of the things that I wanna point out is that in 1982, we began gathering the data based off the ozone layer to see where this hole was at in our ozone layer. By 1987, we've collected so much data to prove that there was a big giant hole in the ozone layer. And one thing that we did as a nation, um, we band together, we got some ideas, and it wasn't just us, but it was a, a few more nations in the world that decided to uh, banned some chemicals that were, were harming the ozone layer the, that was contributing to the giant hole in it. So when we're talking about that, I want to show you the scientific data because me telling you or giving you a giant book to read sometimes um, won't strike a chord. But if you can see it, just like we do on Science on a Sphere here, you'll be able to grasp the concept a little bit more.
1982, we began to gather scientific data to show how big the size of the hole in the ozone layer was. Now, by 1987, we had enough data where we can prove the damage that we were doing to it. So we had a, a couple of nations band together and get rid of harmful chemicals that was contributing to the depletion of the ozone layer itself. So by 2013, it reached the maximum size that it, was, that it had ripped open. Now, the other thing that we're looking at is a recovery side from it. Because we banded some of those chemicals that were harmful to the ozone layer, we began to set for a recovery stage. Now, if you believe it or not, we can get to a recovery stage where we can seal up that hole in the ozone layer. Now, we're looking at a recovery of 2070, a fully restored ozone layer by 2070. And I know a lot of you are saying, well, that's a long time from now, but we also have created rockets that are reusable. And just a few years ago, um, nobody thought that was possible either. If we can fully restore our ozone layer, maybe we can slow down the emissions of carbon dioxide and methane gases into our atmosphere. This is why gathering scientific data is so important. So we can pass it along to our communities and we can figure out how to take care of one issue at a time. I can't wait to see what scientific data we can collect from the South Pole. This is Anthony Galdemus, thanks again. Okay, that was a great uh, presentation by Anthony. If you all are curious, the um, the GLOBE tool that he was using, it's called the Science on a Sphere, and we actually have it at MCC's North Express location. Um, and we currently have quite a few online classes, um, including about climate change for all different age groups available online. Um, so just wanted to let you know that, that that sphere, that teaching tool, it is actually um, a part of MCC's campus and it, it does a really great job of visualizing a lot of, a lot of what we're talking about today. Um, so that, that was great. Um, so next we have our third speaker um, and she is Andrea Beish and she is an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Department of Ag Agronomy and Horticulture. Her area of focus is cropping systems and her research focuses on developing and supporting cropping systems that address profitability, resource use efficiency and climate risks. This includes improving soil health, increasing the use of cover crops and perennial crops, as well as understanding the social and policy dimensions required for climate change, or, and also just required for general change. In her role, she also teaches undergraduate courses in crop management. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Fordham University, an MA in Applied Climate Science from Columbia University, and a PhD in Agronomy and Sustainable Agriculture from Iowa State University. Andrea, thank you for being here today to share your expertise and we'll go ahead and let you take it away. Thank you, Sally, for that great introduction and thank you to your team, Jason, Sharon, um, for the support and invitation to speak with everyone today. So I wanted to talk uh, in my time today about the soil, which might not be something that all of you think a lot about every day and how the soil can help us manage water-related risks such as floods and droughts, which we know are increasing. So Doug did a great job teeing me up for several of the things that I wanna uh, talk a little bit more about today. So, you know, as Doug mentioned in his presentation, there are a number of ways that we might think about climate impacts to agriculture. Um, you know, things like the risks that come with higher temperatures, with increased pests, weeds, maybe even opportunities that come with a longer growing season, which we're experiencing already in places like Iowa and Nebraska. But I wanna focus specifically today on opportunities in Nebraska and the region that I see that are not just relevant for the people who are driving tractors or farm equipment, but for all of us, um, because the decisions that are made on farms really impact all of us. So um, I wanted to get started though with, um, the billion dollar disasters that Doug already showed a little bit about as well. So um, Doug showed you the map. I'm showing you the graph here as well. So 
part of the issues is that the frequency of some of these severe events continue to increase, right? So this is the billion dollar database that NOAA keeps track of. So you can see the average here in the black line of billion dollar events uh, that have occurred since 1980. And so the average is in black, but you could see many of the most recent years are trending above that average. 2020 is trending um, very high above that average as of this month. And we're experiencing, you know, unusual types of extreme events that can have really large impacts on communities, as you know, Doug mentioned, but I want to drive that home for all of us in the state. Um, the floods that happened in Nebraska last year, last winter, in fact, they were in March, were very unusual. They were re the result of a perfect storm, really, where we had a very wet fall going into the year. We had full bodies of water. We had a cold, snowy uh, winter. We had all of this um, snow and ice on the landscape with nowhere to go when we got that very heavy rainstorm in um, snow uh, rain event in um, March of last year. And so this is actually a photo from my partner's family's um, fifth generation farm um, there on the Middle Loop River in St. Paul, Nebraska. So they're in central Nebraska and they've lost at least a few dozen farmable acres thanks to this event. It's just completely transformed this part of their land. And that happened all across the state, right? So there are areas um, with sand deposition, major erosion events that will take years or decades to restore to their prior productivity if they're ever even farmable in the future. And you know, when I look at that billion dollar database, I don't see any other winter flood events like that. They happen you know, in Gulf states or California or other places, but very unusual events. And again, I wanna just reiterate how impactful these events can be to communities, especially in a state like Iowa or Nebraska, where we do have um, a lot of water and rural communities that maybe don't have as many resources to rebound, to rebuild roads, bridges, businesses, et cetera. I mean, like many of you, when you drive around the state, you still come in, uh, into places where the bridges and roads have not been repaired since last year. So that's when we're talking about these things, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about these major flood events that can really impact communities. And we know that floods are only one part of the story, right? That when we think about impacts to agriculture that communities, um, farmers are dealing with an increase in those heavy rain events. So this is data from the 2014 National Climate Assessment. Doug showed um, some data from the 2018 National Assessment. These heaviest 1% of rainfall days are increasing all across the US and even more so in regions like the Midwest and um, the Northeast. And I wanna also, note another important element of the challenges that we're facing uh, when we think about, you know, we're dealing with this signal of climate change, uh, increasing uh, rainfall variability. We have landscapes in our agricultural areas that are also changing as well. So this is a map from a, a paper that I published a few years ago, a map of Iowa in the mid 1800s when the land use was predominantly perennially based, when it was managed just by you know, native communities before white settlement and displacement. So it was predominantly prairie and forest. But the important part of that is to say that those were plants that were growing and using water all year long, covering the soil most of the year to where we are more recently, right? So this is a map that's probably no surprise to anybody here when we look at what our land use is um, today. So in Iowa, like other major corn producing states, we have um, you know, a large percent of area that is used for agriculture and a huge percent that goes to um, predominantly summer annual crops like corn and soybeans that are really only growing and using water for a small part of the year, which, you know, and Doug mentioned too, this change in seasonality of water. So when you think about, and maybe you don't think about it this way, but maybe I'll encourage you to think about it this way. The way I look at this is that, you know, right now, most of our crops have been harvested, but as we get precipitation, right, there's nothing that's potentially growing and using um, that water. And as we have more water in the fall and precipitation in the fall, winter, and spring, that's not typically when we have as many plants growing uh, in this part of the United States. And so we have more floods, more rainfall variability over the last number of decades, coinciding with this really large shift in our cropping systems where we have less live roots in the soil um, and plants growing and transpiring to prevent erosion. Right. And so when I think about those problems and I bring them all together, I always come back to this point that the soil surface is really where the elements of the water cycle converge. So the soil surface is really regulating the in and out flows of 
rainfall, where water infiltrates the soil, where plants are taking up water to grow, to transpire, where you can have runoff leaving fields and going downstream, um, evaporative water losses, that's all happening at the soil surface, right? This is really where the action is happening in my mind in terms of how we might manage water and how I think soil can be a part of um, the solution. So how do we think about agricultural management and some of the most impactful practices for making soil a part of the solution? And I thought I might spend a little time before I get to that, just reminding us about how critical our soil resources. And so I have a, an apple here um, and I wanna illustrate this actually with the nice science on a sphere illustration that Sally just mentioned, um, the great resource that they have uh, at MCC. And so I'm gonna just let this roll here, which what you'll see is the globe spinning. And this is just a map. You'll see the different um, land uses or land covers um, across the world. And so let's think about the earth spinning and think about the size of the apple, right? Okay, so if the earth was an apple, what's the most predominant color that you see here? You can't interact with me. I'd have someone probably call it out, but you can call it out and play along. So the most predominant color that we see on the earth's surface is blue, right? So we know that 75% of the earth's surface is water, okay? So that leaves us not uh, only 25 potential percent of the earth's surface that we could actually grow food. That's the point I wanna try to get you to illustrate, conceptualize here. So I've got one quarter of an apple left here. So 25% is all that's really possible of the earth's surface for us to grow food. But when you look at, again, all these different land uses that are spinning, um, what else do you notice? So you'll see things like savannas, grasslands, shrublands, um, land covers that are um, maybe not as useful for crop production, maybe useful for agriculture in other ways like um, livestock or grazing. Um, but of this 25%, we have things that are not as useful for ag. So we have um, snow covers, we have um, desert, we have you know things that we can't really do a lot for our food. And so of that 25%, we get about half. So now we're at um, an eighth of our apple, right? That's left for potentially growing food. And of this 25%, um, or excuse me, of this one eighth that's remaining, if you're still keeping score, three quarters of that, as you saw at the end of the illustration, are things like um, urban areas or paved roads, um, which are just, you know, not as, again, hospitable for growing food. And so that only leaves us with, we're at a quarter or an eighth here, that only leaves us with um, one quarter of that left. So if you're keeping track, that is just 132nd, right? And so 3% or so of this whole earth that we have is really only what we have available for, for crop production, right? And so when you think about what the soil surface is, it's just really a, a thin sliver of that, right? So it's just really the skin of, of this apple. So I wanna just make the point that it may seem like we have an abundance of soil, but in reality, um, we're only talking about a small percentage of the whole earth surface that is most optimal for growing crops. And <clears throat> not only do we have very little of the earth's surface, but we are losing that soil very quickly thanks to things like heavy rain events, right? So this is actually a really interesting new paper that was recently published that um, I wanted to share, which is research from um, scientists in the United Kingdom where they took this concept of a soil lifespan and they basically said, um, how long would it take for erosion rates to degrade the top 30 centimeters of the soil, which is really the top soil, the most critical part for food production. So even a tinier part of that sliver of the uh, apple skin, um, how long would it take at current erosion rates to degrade that amount? And so they compiled experiments from all over the world and they grouped the data based on different experiments. And what they actually found very, very, uh, important, I think, for us in agricultural states or our economies that depend on um, these things, that about 16% of soils globally could be degraded within 100 years based on current erosion rates. Okay, so that's pretty shocking, right? It's a huge amount um, that could be lost just within even 100 years. But the interesting thing, when I say they grouped the data by different um, practices, they found that conservation measures, which is what I'm going to spend the rest of my presentation here talking about, such as reduced tillage, cover crops, grasslands, those are some of the things that they looked at that those could actually slow erosion rates to extend the lifespan of that soil to over 10,000 years. 
So there is a positive <laughs> story here about what we can do to conserve our precious soil resource and solutions to reversing some of those worst impacts of climate on our soil. So I wanna transition into talking about the concept of soil health and some of the solutions that I study and as I see them. So what is soil health? Soil health is also maybe referred to as soil quality. So maybe some of you have heard, heard that term as well. Um, it's really defined as the continued capacity of the soil to function as a living system that can support humans and animals uh, and life, right? And this definition in my mind is really important because it speaks to the importance of managing for future generations and not just for the short term, but for the longer term. And that really ties nicely for me into how we think about soil for um, water management and some of these biological, chemical and physical aspects of the soil. And so what I'm depicting in this um, next image here is some of the widely agreed upon principles of uh, soil health that are known to promote the functioning of physical, chemical, and biological properties of the soil. So what are some of those practices? They include things like um, having um, livestock integrated on croplands, trying to minimize disturbance of the soil, maximizing the amount of above ground diversity that we have, as well as having continuous roots in the soil with practices like cover crops, which is actually what my virtual background is. I know I kind of fade in and out, but I wanted to have this nice photo of a cover crop. Um, this is a cereal rye cover crop, which is something that we would grow when the soil would otherwise be bare to protect it. So if you see green out around Iowa, Nebraska now, it might be um, it might be winter wheat, but it might also be a cover crop like cereal rye um, that can grow during the cold uh, periods and establish quickly in the fall and makes a really nice cover. And so this is a, one of our research experiments. I actually took this when I was there last week. So these are some of the principles that are widely agreed upon that are known to promote soil health. And what I'm showing you here are some of the popular infographics in my world that have been developed by the USDA. I think they're great to illustrate this point um, that there is a relationship between healthier soil and water. And I think these are great to illustrate the magnitude potentially of water savings. Um, they sound all really well and good, but I think there's a lot of important science questions behind them. And I wanna show you just a little bit um, today in my presentation about what I found in my own research to support some of these ideas. Um, so again, sharing a little bit about some of the research questions that we've tried to answer related to um, these questions at the intersection of climate and agriculture. And so um, I've done work and will continue to do work on these questions of soil health, water, both at a field scale. So what are the impacts of soil health practices at the field scale? What management or systems can be the most impactful? And then what does this mean at a landscape scale to be the most effective? And um, I've, I have less experience on that second question. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some um, future work that I'm planning to do in Nebraska, but some, some positive um, information on the larger scale as well. So what I'm sharing with you here is work that has been published in a couple of different papers and different reports um, where we compiled, similar to that UK study that I mentioned, we compiled um, experiments from around the world looking at different conservation practices that measured infiltration rates. So they had um, either some kind of conventional control and one of the conservation practices that I'm showing here, and they measured infiltration, which is the rate that water enters the soil. It's really important when we think about these heavy rain events and how we get water into the soil and staying there rather than running off, staying there for periods when it might be drier. And so what you're seeing here is Again, um, published in a, a few papers in the report, you see the URL here, and I'd be happy to, to share these references with anyone who's interested. But um, essentially, again, we compiled all these studies, um, compared them to a more conventional control, looked around the world. Um, and again, just by looking at this, you can see some things get studied more than others. But what we found is that there are some things that are more impactful than others. In fact, this is um, just showing you the ranking of um, less impactful to more impactful practices. So some things like no-till and crop rotation did have a um, positive effect, but not as consistent or large as some of the other practices here, like cover crops compared to annual crops, um, grazing management, so more rotational grazing compared to more continuous grazing, and then perennials compared to annuals. And so what's kind of the common denominator here? Actually, we um, 
hypothesized from all this work is that um, those practices that had continuous roots in the soil, so that's hopefully one take home you'll get from my presentation today, those continuous roots in the soil had the greatest impact on infiltration rates. And so just to show this in a slightly different way here, this is an illustration where we're showing some of the possible mechanisms for um, that might be occurring with those roots in the soil and leading to better infiltration. So it could be, again, those continuous roots, the perennial and the cover crops that had the largest um, and most consistent effect on infiltration. It could be due to increased um, biological activity in the soil, improved soil structure, reduced soil compaction, increased soil carbon, any of these things. But we were really pleased that we were able to see that signal across all these studies around the world that there are um, some practices that can be more effective, but especially with roots um, in the soil. So that's why I get real grumpy when I drive around in the winter and I see bare soil. Hope maybe you'll start to see it the same way too. Okay, so I wanna also share um, a little bit of related work on a field scale, but just some, some work that um, my research team and I are doing um, in Nebraska about how this, these kind of practices can improve water uh, on a farm. So I wanna just share a little bit from a project that I'm a part of, which is a partnership with the USDA NRCS and Extension uh, in Nebraska, where we are working with farmers. So we have a series of farmer collaborators who are doing on-farm research where they have replicated um, strips of different experiments on their um, farms. And they have utilized different soil health management systems. So different things like cover crops or cover crops and livestock, cover crops and no-till. So many or most of them have cover crops and um, are experimenting with some different soil health management systems. So the treatments here vary from farm to farm. Um, some also have some um, small grains in their crop rotation. So we're doing um, more crops than just corn and soybean. Um, and what we found, I wanted to show you some interesting results from um, my team, my graduate student, Fernanda Krupek, um, and a team took these measurements last summer, which again, as Doug has already mentioned, and many in your recent memory will recall, it was a very wet year uh, in the area. And so when they went out and they measured infiltration rates in different soil types, because depending on the texture of your soil and any number of other factors, um, we might see different effects of management, right? So they measured in different soil infiltration in different soil types, and they looked at the uh, more conventional strips on the farms, and they which would be no cover crop in this instance, um, and maybe tillage to the soil health systems, which had the soil health strips, which had cover crops and or um, no till. And then they also looked at a reference or rangeland site, something nearby with the same soil type on that farm that was maybe perennially based and less disturbed. And so what we found was really interesting, right? So if you look at the infiltration rates in the conventional farms, and this is at three of the locations that I just showed you, um, the conventional infiltration rates were the lowest, higher were soil health significantly, and the rangeland or reference sites were um, the same or even higher than the soil health system. So I think that's really interesting because that matches almost exactly what we found in our big global analysis and shows that even on farms, this is something that can be um, effective at improving infiltration in the soil. And myself and others like to talk about soils being like a sponge that can be um, absorbing of more water and holding on to it for drier periods. Um, and so I sometimes think about soil as a sponge, but here's a great um, story that the NRCS put together of one of the farmers who's collaborating on our project who actually described his soil like an arc, which I thought was, was a really great metaphor, right? And so um, even though, you know, so this is in reference to the 2019 flooding that was experienced that even though the soil surface was frozen at that time, as the water got into the soil and those floodwaters receded, he noted that he had um, a huge amount of protection from the um, field such that, you know, he just felt this cover crop was an arc um, and not just a sponge. So again, I think that there's a great success story, not just on experiments here with infiltration, but also on working farms. And then I wanted to share briefly about um, the larger scale benefit of soil health practices. What could this mean for communities? And I want to just show uh, really quickly um, some work uh, that has happened in the Shell Creek watershed, which is in Northeast Nebraska um, near the Columbus area. And actually they had noticed 
um, a lot of impacts from flooding in their watershed. And a group of farmers and others who were concerned about this came together um, in 1999 and formed their own watershed group to try to address it. And there were some estimates taken of conservation practices at a few different points. And I'm just showing you here where this watershed is in Northeast Nebraska. And what have they found? It's a really positive story, right? So they estimate that in their watershed, they have increased the amount of till reduced tillage from uh, 14 to 87%. So that's pretty huge. There's been a really big investment there of um, federal and state dollars to support some of the conservation. Um, and a really positive note, and something I'm not really talking a lot about today is the fact that they were able to declassify their watershed for impaired with atrazine um, in 2018. And so what I'm not mentioning a lot about is water quality, right? And so water pollution is a huge issue in agricultural areas in states like Nebraska and Iowa. And lots of the things that I'm talking about here can have a mutual benefit uh, on water quality as well. In fact, I would say that's a large reason that there's so much interest right now in um, soil health or one of, the, one of the reasons. And the other piece of the, the Shell Creek watershed that I think is really interesting is that they anecdotally report that there were lower peaks in their heavy rain events that were experienced during floods in 1990 um, compared to 2011. So a lower peak in 2011 than 1990. And so they um, share that. And actually we've been in discussions, myself and colleague, um, in doing some more work to try to validate that, to try to understand what has really happened, um, kind of like a hindcast, if you will. So we um, are hoping to do some more work in this watershed um, in the future. Okay, so there's good news when we think about how the soil and soil health can help us um, with water. And I wanna just close with a few thoughts really about what you can do and how you can be involved in this, right? So soil health is really a popular topic right now. So major news sources are talking about it. People are, I think, resonating with the idea that their health is similar to soil health, right? And so I, I love this little photo from the Washington Post last year. Soil your undies is the funny little demo that they do where I've never done this myself, but the idea is that you can bury cotton underwear um, in different, you know, under different soils, under different management. And the faster that it decomposes is a, been a proxy of the soil biological activity. And so um, that was on the cover of the Washington Post. How cool is that? And then actually the infiltration work that I've been talking about today was featured in the Omaha World Herald just about a year ago. And it was pretty exciting. We get the Sunday paper here. And um, you know, I don't think it'll be every Sunday when I get to see myself on the cover of the Omaha World Herald, but this was great. It shows that people are interested in this. And even more exciting, I think, is that you know, more so I'm fairly early in my career, but been in this for about a decade. And this is the, the most that I've ever heard agriculture tied into the climate discussion, right? That there were numerous debates where um, soil being a part of the solution, cover crops was actually said in a debate. I was so excited to hear that. There's like an understanding that we can address problems, we can support rural and urban communities with solutions that are soil-based, right? And there's also expanding state solutions, expanding markets for um, ecosystem service solutions that might see the, the growth of some of these practices. And you know, I wanna just end with how we're doing in Nebraska. I think we have some things to be really positive about and also, you know, room to grow. So in 2019, the unicameral po um, passed a piece of legislation where they created a healthy soils task force. And that is a group of leaders, um, farmers, and um, state agency folks who are developing a plan for the state to move forward with increasing the use of soil health related practices. So I've been in um, discussion with that group a lot. They've had involved the university and other stakeholders, which has been great. And they're planning to report, put out a report um, later this year into early next year for the governor to try to stimulate again, the use of soil health related practices. So that's really positive. It's I think stimulated more discussion in the state. You know, and I would also share in a positive that we actually in Nebraska do lead the Corn Belt in acres of no-till, which is great. We have about 50% of our row crop acres in no-till. And we have, um, we had 357,000 acres of cover crops in 2012, according to the Census of Agriculture. Um, and we had a huge percentage increase um, in 2017, which is great. Um, I would also, if I was in person, ask you to play along if anybody knows how many actual row crop acres we have um, in Nebraska. 
so, so we know what percentage this is, right? So we have about 18 to 20 million acres of row crop. So that still only represents a small percentage of row crop acres, right? So it's just about 4% of our cropland that is actually using cover crop. So, so we're doing well in some ways, but there's still a lot more opportunity in my mind to grow so that I don't have to drive around in the winter and be sad about bare soil. And I wanna just <laughs> kind of wrap up here with some of the ways you can support this. This is a picture of our dog. Um, Quincy, he's three and a half, he's an Airedale Terrier. He's precious, our soil is precious. That's why I'm putting it here, <laughs> it's a good visual. Um, how can you support this, right? I think you're just being aware that soil can be a solution and that there are things that can uh, be beneficial to communities is, is huge. So tell your friends after today, if this is new to you. And I think we in the public have really important voices. I think we can all agree that we wanna see vibrant rural and urban communities. And um, you know, there is billions of dollars of taxpayer dollars every year that go into support farming, to support conservation, even more so in the last um, few years with um, trade uncertainty, with um, COVID, right? So, so we have a stake in this too, in my mind. And so I encourage you to be aware and to you know, recognize that the soil surface, again, it's where the action is happening. It's really critical in my mind for water management. There are things that we can do like growing cover crops to improve the soil's capacity to infiltrate and store water. So I encourage you to all think about that. And we'll end with, you know, the note of the Dust Bowl and something that is probably in a lot of people's memory and, you know, a reminder that history has taught us that the way that humans interact with their land can have profound impacts. Um, so I'll leave you with this image here of the Dust Bowl and this important quote that I really like um, from FDR. We are in a different difficult period right now for agriculture, but we can um, support practices and management that supports communities and farmers. That's all I have. Thank you and look forward to answering some of your questions. Great, thank you. Um, really appreciate that. Learned a lot more about soil health and how it impacts. And this is definitely so important for our state as, as we rely on agriculture. Um, so we do have a few questions here. Um, just a reminder, if you do have a question, please go ahead and put it in that Q&A and we'll get to it um, as soon as possible. These are questions both for Andrea and Doug um, to answer. But the first one that we have actually, Andrea, is for you. Um, so could you please tell us a little bit about how do you know if a soil is healthy? Like what are some of the things that you look at for that? that that's a great question. Um, and I think it's part of what makes it challenging for people to, maybe for farmers to like be able to quantify. I mean, I think there are some simple tests that the USDA um, is happy to help farmers look at. I think infiltration is, is one important test. I think even just looking at um, texture of the soil, um, how it feels, um, how much erosion has happened, which is sometimes harder to just see visually because you can have, you know, water moving soil and it's not as, you know, visible. Um, so I think there's some, some small visual things you can do. I, again, think a lot about infiltration. Um, but yeah, so, so, so there are some small visual things that one might do, but I also think that it is potentially harder to quantify that exactly. And that's kind of a big active area of discussion in the soil health world. Like what do we measure? What's the benchmark? Um, but I think that there are some smaller visual indicators that can be quick and easy. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah, thank you. Um, and, you know, I think that this was, okay. Um, sorry, Anna, there's another one for you. Um, could you speak about the carbon se uh, sequestration benefit with soil health practices? Yeah, that is a great question too, and something that I have less experience in and didn't talk about today. But you know, the mutual benefit of soil health for water quality, there are other many other benefits, including carbon sequestration. So there is um, some synthesis work that has found that cover crops, for example, can improve carbon and the soil can increase soil carbon. Um, some studies that show that for um, crop rotations, although I feel like sometimes that's a little variable. Um, perennial crops, I, I'm familiar with some synthesis work that shows that they absolutely do increase carbon. Um, the magnitude and how much that varies by location and the length of time that practices has been in place is all dependent on environment management. I would say too, in this conversation, I think there's a lot of excitement about the 
start carbon sequestration potential, but I think that there's a lot of evidence that would show that there is a limit to that potential and it's not a panacea. I meant to say that earlier, there's no silver bullets to anything that we're talking about here with agriculture, climate, et cetera. So I think there's a potential and all the things I just talked about today are co-benefits of carbon and, and water, but this is not a panacea, um, but there are definitely benefits. And, and I think there's you know, all the more that we study and understand what the potential capacity of different practices in different regions is. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so if individuals are interested in sharing what they've learned here today, um, we will have this presentation recorded and put on our Hubbard website, which is mccneb.edu backslash Hubbard. Um, but if they're interested in sharing this with their communities or possibly in the classrooms, um, do you know what type of teaching um, tools that your organizations might offer to help people share this knowledge? And this for Doug or Andrea, feel free. Um, there is a website called the Climate Resilience Toolkit that may be of interest to folks. Um, it was created in the last administration when we kept hearing that, uh, golly, all you federal agencies and everybody else are doing, you know, we're go go just going their own way when it comes to um, planning and adaptation, resilience, all that stuff. So the last administration directed uh, uh, us, NOAA, to consolidate all of that as much as possible in one place. So you'll see a lot of examples of what, uh, all kinds um, of examples of what urban and rural and others have done across the country. Uh, and we're in the process of regionalizing it. We're actually working on the Northern Great Plains as we speak. It'll be done in the next few months, uh, regionalizing, it, regionalizing it somewhat. So I would, I would go to that website and check it out. Um, it would have, for example, a lot of the things that Andrea talked about in terms of examples of soil health and, and links to NRCS and all those folks who do that kind of work generally, I, I believe. <clears throat> I would add that, yes, the NRCS has great resources available in terms of small videos and farmers talking about you know, practices on their farms. Um, that's on their YouTube channel. So if you go to the NRCS YouTube channel, that's one place that you might find more information. Um, there was a great resource that UNL Extension put together I actually don't have a formal extension appointment. So I'm sure there's many resources out there that I'm not familiar with, but um, the um, Weather Ready Farms resource, which has nice interactives to think about some of the practices that we've talked about, that I talked about, and even more of, you know, different um, weather risks that might be faced or increasing and, and how you might think about managing them. That's a resource that I really like. Uh, the university also did put out, shortly before I started, I started about three years ago, they put out um, another kind of state climate impact report that would take, you know, information from those national climate assessments and, you know, relate it to what's happening in the state. So they have a report there as well. Um, and I'm sure I'm going to think of a bunch of things after this. So if there's something specific that folks are interested in, um, I'm happy to speak to it. We have more soil health information on the Crop Watch websites, which is kind of our main hub for extension and, um, producer information, but some of that is really nice for the, you know, kind of broader public as well. So feel free to follow up with me if, if there's something that you're thinking of maybe that you can't find. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, I know that we have just about one minute left. So Andrea and Doug, I just real quickly, if there's one thing that you would like our viewers to take away today, um, what would that be? And specifically, you know, what can, what can homeowners do? What can we do on our, on our individual scale? Um, well, I, I would, I, I guess I would recommend, um, I, I have conversations, I'm on a homeowners association, right? And so uh, I have several neighbors who talk to me about these types of things. And uh, one of them is a major uh, solar uh, energy type of person. So uh, from a home point of view, if you really want to go to that expense, which will pay back, pay itself back over time, of course, is, is the introduction of solar to your, to your home. Of course, all the normal things you probably are already doing in terms of recycling, 
been driving less. And uh, I'm sure Andrea has some agriculturally based ideas. Uh, there are some vegan ideas out there. I won't go into. I won't go into, but I'll let Andrea address. <laughs> I mean, I think that you know. My take on it is, you know, you can do some things individually and they are important, but I also think that it's important to think about how we bring about change in, you know, policy. And I have been so pleased to see over the last, you know, few years, like I mentioned that agriculture is being tied into the climate conversation. And, you know, I um, participated in the climate march in Washington, DC in 2017, and it was so empowering, hundreds of thousands of people who turned out to march. Um, friends of mine who came who wouldn't typically be excited about that. I think just, you know, climate has become a really important issue and agriculture is now part of that. It's not, I think, as top of mind for most people. And so um, continuing to talk about it and, and keeping it top of mind, um, I think I would say, you know, there's the individual, but also the bigger picture um, that I would encourage you to be a part of as well. And let me add one quick thing. Um, there's certainly been in the last five to 10 years, a lot more interest. And I've read enough articles about this to, to think this is probably true. <laughs> uh, people who direct pensions, people who, who, who move money around for you, for your savings, uh, for the stock market and such are beginning or have take, taken into account environmental and social um, issues to some degree, because they're looking at companies now in terms of a couple things. One, in terms of if, if there is going to be a liability uh, by putting uh, time and money into a particular company over time, that's one. Number two, the company's exposure to, let's say, sea level rise. If everything they make comes from a few feet above sea level, that means that's a more risky company to invest in, for example. So they're looking at it, and these are important because uh, this is big money. I mean, we're talking trillions, not just billions, we're talking trillions of dollars in terms of where they're placed. So um, of course, uh, you know, the federal government has a place perhaps in, in some of this, but um, so do we all, as, as I think Andrea was saying, in terms of where we put our efforts. I'll leave it at that. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you again to our speakers and to everyone who attended. Um, we appreciate you being here, and we'll have the recording on the website here in the next week or so. So have a great afternoon, and thank you again.